Dear Diary, the uh, eclipse of the century on April 8th turned out to be a dud. It was just cloudy all day. It was actually kind of nice because it was cloudy and dark, almost like severe thunderstorms, but without the severe thunderstorms. So, at this point in my life when I have so little money, I ended up wasting all that money on these glasses for nothing. So I guess that's 99 cents down the drain. And it reminds me of something though. I had mentioned in I had mentioned in previous videos that when I went into hotels, I started out as a desk clerk and a year later I was my boss's boss's boss and they had created a whole department for me for me to create and they formed the department basically around my skills. And I'd forgotten, actually, that at my next job in medical, even here in Minnesota, my next job in medical, they basically did the same thing. I came in as a temp. I was uh, doing something there for about three, I don't know, three to five months or so. I was taking over for a young woman who was uh, pregnant and giving birth. And then when they hired me in, they kind of created a new department again for me. This is kind of how my life had been up until I started working at this company I just got fired from for eight years, where they just kept me sitting there with a headset on, talking on the telephone, doing the exact same thing for eight years with no advancement whatsoever. So if you go all the way back to about 1990, maybe late 1989. At that time I was finishing up my undergraduate. I graduated in 1991, so I guess May of 91. So sometime before May of 1990 there was another solar eclipse. I remember this because I was an intern at a planetarium at that time for a couple, several years. And the, the, the planetarium was part of the public museum for this large city that we were in. So it was a real institution in the city. And the planetarium director was what himself was an institution in the city. One of those well-known celebrities, you know, local celebrities within a, a large city. Wonderful guy. Just absolutely wonderful. Dave. Um, everyone I work with there, the three full-timers, Dave, Mark, and Gary, they were they were just fantastic. I'm so blessed to have ever worked with those people. And, and the planetarium was at one end of this public museum, and it was a really neat museum. It had some really, really cool displays in it. And there was a solar eclipse. The museum paid to have the full-time staff go and view the eclipse. But the eclipse was only visible, I believe, in the Pacific Ocean. It might be the Atlantic, but it was one of the oceans. So to get to the eclipse, they had to go through the trouble of taking a cruise ship. So basically, they went on a cruise for the eclipse. And, you know, I mean, being young and naive, you know, I said, well, why don't I get to go? <laughs> and they said, well, somebody's got to run the planetarium and sit in for us while we're gone. I said, oh, great. So I said, all right, that's how you want to play it. That's how you want to play it. You're going to see how I roll then. So I ran the planetarium. I maintained the projectors, did all the stuff you have to do. And one of the things I had to do, though, was sit in on the board of directors for, uh, for the planetarium director. Basically just sit in, you know, answer questions, write down any notes for him. And I, to this day, I don't know how I did it, because I was probably only, geez, 22, or I don't know how old I was at that time. But um, somehow, 
I talked the board of directors into buying a laser light system for the planetarium so we could do laser light music shows. <laughs> without even talking to the director <laughs> so I just sold them on it I told them what it is I told them how much money they can make with it and how many people it'll bring in to the museum and <laughs> so when the full-time staff came back from their cruise they had about $25,000 taken out of their budget for this laser light show gear <laughs> and um so they let me do the first laser light show and I did it to the music of the band Rush, my favorite band. And I called the show The Spirit of Rush. I wish I had a guitar right now because you know one of their most famous songs is The Spirit of Radio. <laughs> Begin the day with a friendly voice, a companion unobtrusive. And I thought that was clever, The Spirit of Rush. Um, it took me a year to make this plant, this laser light show, a whole year. And in fact, really, almost the time I got done with it, I only got to present it maybe five or six times before I had to move a thousand miles to graduate school. And um, so the planetarium director had to do something. I don't know if he's getting back at me or what, but he changed the name of the show to something that was not as cool at all. But that was that was when I left anyway. So. The thing is, we get this laser light show gear, and at the time, they didn't have the scanners, you know, they're just servo fast-moving mirrors, and red, blue, and green, well, I'm, yeah, we had red, blue, and green, RGB lasers, and then you, you make them scan, and as they mix, they change, you know, that's what creates the colors on a palette and all that, and... The thing was, at that time, you know, 1990, they didn't have the technology to sit down and draw pictures and tell the laser to draw a picture, an image of something. That wasn't coming probably for another five years in its primitive form. These were just based on mathematical formulas. And at the time, you know, I was finishing up undergrad, so I was pretty high-level math. I was, I don't know, calculus three, um, calc-based statistics, discrete structures, things like that. And... It was right up my alley because I knew I knew these formulas so well. The, the the lasers basically graphed mathematical formulas, you might say it, but they moved so fast and they would scan it that it would create these solid figures. So they'd be circles. It was a lot like spirograph, kind of, but you could make it do other things. You know, if you know anything about fractals and things like that, you could make it do a lot of really neat stuff. But you couldn't just draw a picture of a house or a smiley face or something like that. So it took me a year. I had great fun with it. I, we had, I believe, four-track tape. And I think two tracks were for the lasers. One track, well, it was in stereo, so now two tracks must have been for the audio. So I went to the local radio station, and back then the radio stations were still king. It was just at the tail end of that because Clear Channel was buying them all up around the country and turning them into, you know, an amorphous mess that presented this same narrative to everyone in the country it was kind of the beginning of the end of the country and and um but at the time the radio stations the radio djs were these celebrities in the community even more so than the television personalities and i mean television had only been around for you know not not that long at that time and you know 20 years or so in any meaningful form so i already knew the the djs at some of the radio stations especially the one i went to and I went down there to record the soundtrack. So I had all the Rush songs laid out and we in, and we did it in between songs. So he's sitting there doing his DJ stuff and he would he would spin you know, spin some vinyl and then he would come over well, at the time they had CDs and he'd spin something and then he'd turn over to me and we would start working on the soundtrack. And one of the most interesting things it really blew my mind. It was one of those epiphanies I'll never forget in my life and I don't know why. But um the beginning of Tom Sawyer, they had these CD players that, you know, I mean, all I had ever had were these big, long, it was like this long tape recorder, and you had to push record and play at the same time, and then you hit the stop button when you're done, and it goes, I mean, I, I did this thing when I was nine years old, a mashup like that, and you can just hear the in between, because there's no way to edit smoothly, and then through the 80s, they started getting home stereo gear, so they had you know, the big, my, my Pioneer SX303 receiver, 
and the TAC dual cassette recorder for dubbing. But if you're going to record on the tape, you still have that problem that you had to push record and play and you had to hit the stop button, which introduced this loud noise. So it wasn't until I got to the planetarium, started using reel to reel, that I got you know, able to make audio the real way, like they do in a music studio. But at the, um, at the radio station, they had CD players, and these things could actually play frame by frame. So that, that's how they would cue them up, right to where they want them. So they, they do their talking, and bam, they hit it, and pff, the song starts. So when Tom Sawyer started, well, this is the live version. The, I don't think the studio version has a count off, but the live version has, you know, one, two, three, four, two. Modern day warrior, mean, mean stride. Today's Tom Sawyer, mean, mean stride. Well, the thing was, when you go frame by frame like that, Neil Peart hit his bass drum like two frames before the rest of the band came in. So when I, when I, and this is 1990, I mean, today that means nothing to anybody. At the time, though, it was like to have that kind of visibility, that kind of low-level visibility on audio was just brand new to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, Neil Peart made a mistake. <laughs> it just threw my whole world into disarray. Neil Peart was perfect. Um, I, I like to believe that the rest of the band just came in two frames later, which kind of saves... So it was Alex and Getty who screwed up. But, um, I don't know, it doesn't seem strange now, but I mean, at the time, it was really weird for me to, to hear something at that level, being able to slice things like that, where I could hear what exactly what he was doing. And the idea that he hit the bass drum, I mean, it was only like a thousandth of a second early. I mean, it didn't matter, but it was, it was just interesting. So I recorded the soundtrack there, and then... You record the laser on, I believe, two tracks, if I remember right, on the four-track tape, and then uh, the other track was something that I recorded. It was a spoken voice that I recorded to give instructions to the person presenting the show. So when we're back there with the planetarium show, we'd have our headphones on, kind of like a DJ would, and you know we tell everyone what's going on, and we get it started, and and the Godot projector comes up and starts displaying the stars and you start running the show and um, then the person presenting the show on this you hear me saying okay cue up uh, projector A1 okay get ready three two one and you hit the button and a spaceship goes flying by or something like that so for all the special effects in the show that's how we would do it so it, I spent a year on that and I remember toward the end, um, I was getting a little short on time because again, I was I was getting ready to graduate and then move to a thousand miles away to graduate school. So um, I started going in at night. So I would go into this planetarium in the middle of the night, like two or three in the morning. And so I had to turn off the alarm for the whole museum, which was cool because I got to just walk through the whole museum at night by myself. They didn't even have a security guard there. Those were the days. Wow didn't even need a security guard then and so I would go in at two or three in the morning and a couple times I would actually bring my guitar and my big heavy PV amp in and I'd put it next to the Godot projector and I'd fire up the laser show so you've got this super loud music on this incredible sound system all these lasers doing this rush stuff and I'm sitting there with the guitar you know and I'm just walking around it was so much fun and but one of the one of the nights, uh, somehow or other, I forgot to turn off the alarm. So I was in there doing that, playing the guitar with this thing, and the police walk in. <laughs> and and I, I felt like they had caught me there, like, buck naked or something. I was just like, ah, I'm supposed to be here. <laughs> Seriously, I am. And um, they believed me, fortunately. But it was just tons of fun. But the thing is... Even back then, when I was an intern, I was able to initiate something that took that planetarium to a brand new level. And that's how it had been at all my jobs, up until this job where they just sat me answering phones for eight years. The only thing they ever gave me extra was at one time they wanted me to maintain some online you know, stuff, Amazon, Reverb, that kind of thing. But they weren't going to pay me any extra, it was just extra work. 
which is what they did. It was just, oh, what a, it really was a rotten company. Um, but it's the only company I've really worked for that I can think of, I mean, of a, of a large scale other than a small job that just didn't take advantage of my skills at all. And in fact, they just took my skills and flushed them down the toilet a month ago by firing me for no reason. Uh, utter incompetence. Um, that's good memories, though, going back there. Okay, so I need to... I'm just doing some catch-up here. Uh, you know, cat, catching up on stuff, random notes that I had. I need to issue an apology. Uh, I, uh, I think it was yesterday, actually. I posted a phony telephone interview with Human Resources in New Jersey. Um, the person at the other end was uh, Charles Manson. And um, that, you know, that was kind of a cheap shot. And I. I so I, you know, I got to be fair, I do want to apologize for that. Um, I know he's not alive, so I can't really say it to him now, but Charlie, I am really sorry I did that to you. You do not deserve to have people think you're as bad as human resources. I am so sorry, man. The thing with Manson is that he didn't, I don't think he killed anybody, but he did kind of inspire his followers to kill several people. Um, but I think you can count them on one hand. Human resources, the industry, has destroyed the lives of probably tens of thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands, at least in terms of hurting badly. Um, human resources is so much more destructive than Charles Manson. I would, I would in fact feel bad if I, as bad as Manson was, he, he took a rap for the things that he really never did. It's about time human resources starts taking the rap for what they've done. Along those lines, something came into my mind as I was doing that. Back in the 80s, there were some really good, it was a period where some really good comics started. Prior to that, all we had were these horrible comics in the paper. They were like Charlie Brown, what they call it, Peanuts. And that was from Tra Schultz, who lived down here in Minneapolis. Charlie Brown comic strip is about him growing up in Minneapolis. That's why it's like the darkest, most depressing comic ever. The whole thing is Lucy holding the football, telling Charlie Brown, come and kick the ball. And he tries, and she pulls it away, and he falls down. And then she says she'll do it again, and he falls for it again and again. In other words, Lucy just lies through her teeth. She's a backstabber. And this guy falls for it over and over and over again. Schultz moved to California. He apparently didn't think that highly of Minnesota. But the, the Peanuts comic strip, that's why it's such a dark and depressing comic, because it's about growing up in Minnesota nice. And, um, I mean, that's all we really had were these really unfunny comics. In the mid-'80s, these comics started coming out in our paper that were um, like Calvin and Hobbes and The Far Side and Dilbert. And we started getting these just these like Michelangelo and you know Dutch masters of comics it was unbelievable it was such a great time and Dilbert in particular this guy was coming out of corporate America Scott Adams and it occurred to me that one of the go one of the ongoing uh, jokes in Dilbert had to do with human resources and I can't remember exactly what it was it was I think it was a cat it might have been cat bird or something or it might have been a skunk, I mean that would make more sense, but something like that, but I think it had horns. But the human resource department, I believe, was down in the basement. And when you open the door, you would see flames, the flames of hell. And I think the human resource person had horns. It would... And at the time, I didn't get the joke because I had not encountered human resources. I wouldn't encounter human resources for another five, ten years probably. We had personnel departments which got the job done. Um, but now it just suddenly occurred to me, holy cow, that's what Scott Adams was talking about the whole time. He was talking about human resources. So I'm definitely not the first person to point out that human resources needs to go. It needs to disappear from the face of the earth. It's a destructive institution. It, it operates in the darkness, just like Scott Adams was showing, down in the basement in the darkness, but with the flames. Um, I just found that interesting. I gotta go look at some old Dilbert and see what that really was about, if I can stomach it. I'm gonna skip over this for now and do a diary entry just on that. So let's go into my health here a little bit. 
I had another tooth break in half. It's this molar back here, the furthest one I have back, which isn't very far because most of my teeth are gone. So it doesn't feel good at all. It's totally exposed on one side and the gum is just totally raw and hurts very badly. This tooth up here, which is the equivalent of this tooth here, uh, there's no back to it. So this thing's going to just break off any day now. I, I don't know when. I'm doing everything I can to keep it, but it's gone. So I'm going to have two big gaps up here. While Human Resources and their, and their junk emails they send me say, We wish you well in your new career. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do real well in the job interview. Well, I'm 56 years old. I live in my car. I'm sorry that I smell like a sewer, but I have absolutely nowhere to shower. Um, you know, my, my teeth are missing, so I can't give you the smile that has probably been my best, most popular attribute throughout my entire life, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as I try to get anything that resembles a salary that was my reward for eight years of tenure. It took me eight years to get my salary and my bonuses up to the level where it was. I will never have that ever again. Which is why I'm gonna lose everything in storage. I don't wanna think about that. I do not wanna think about that because that's what makes me wanna die. I'm sickened by my own smell. I lost my sense of smell for what it's worth halfway through living in this car so probably four years ago five years ago I just lost my sense of smell and I don't know why I, I like my sense of smell it makes things taste better I like smelling things um, it's there to protect you it's a defense mechanism it's there to help save your life it, but I lost it from being in this car and it was probably a, a mechanism of my body because my own smell is so bad that's why I, I can't tell how bad I smell and I just have to always be conscious of the fact that I smell probably far worse than I think I do and I gotta keep my distance from people. In fact I went to a holiday a gas station last week Saturday which now with the weather you've got everybody out on the weekends there's nowhere you can go where there are not people it's they're everywhere and families and everything so I go into this gas station and all I wanted to do was walk in, walk around the counter and pay for gas and go get some gas. That's all I wanted to do. Walk in, walk around the counter, pay for gas, leave. Well, I go up here and there's a family right there and there's no room to squeeze by them. So I smell so bad I can't do it. So I go down here to the next lane. I go in and there's another family there. So I come out and I go to the far one where the coolers are. and again another family so I turn the other direction and there's a family down here and then I come back and I think this family had made their way so I had no choice but to go by them and of course when you have a family of little kids little kids often are totally uninhibited so they'll just come right out and say oh daddy that guy smells like your garbage can which is just a wonderful thing that I want to hear for someone who wants to maintain his hygiene but has no way to do so it's just a lovely thing to hear Anyway, I just kept going around and I could not even get, I couldn't even get halfway around this counter. There were so many people. So I ended up just having to leave and not get any gas. All because of the smell. That's the only reason. And that's me trying to be kind for the other people. But instead of them understanding that and appreciating it, all they do is give me the old, Ew, you smell. A lot like this jerk off over here who gives me that nasty look after I, while he's walking on the sidewalk that I had just shoveled the snow off of to keep him safe. That idiot sits there and gives me one of these. That's the same thing these people in these stores do. They don't understand how much effort I'm going through to try to not make them smell me. The only thing, because it's just me, me, I, I, I. Everything's them, 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 them. Other people don't matter. And if the smell affects them, they're going to bring it up. They don't even think about everything I have to go through to try to avoid exposing them to that smell. My feet. I've been in the car now full time for a month. One week after I got into the car again, I made a film of my left foot because I needed a, like a stock photo, you might say, of that, of the way that my toe has been so corrupted from sleeping in the Cougar because of the way the wheel well was with the cougar my foot would be in there and it just slowly over time just bent my bones in there and then of course the 13 months I had to walk to work at my age 
I had to walk on that foot and it's not excruciating but it is very painful and I'm always very conscious of it um, and if you you know how you do the thing with your toes where you stretch your toes like that if I do that it is one of the worst feelings I've ever had it just it feels so totally wrong my other foot just perfectly normal you you feel the the toes rubbing against each other because they're off so anyway here's what my left foot looked like one week after I came into the car that was three weeks ago then I filmed my feet again because by now they've gone back to being swollen which puts me at very high risk for heart attack and things like that it's extremely dangerous to have that kind of swell, swelling and in fact it's my hips all the way down that are swollen all the tone and definition of my legs are completely gone they're just like solid smooth solid masses of of just flesh and liquid my, my legs are they're not even legs anymore they're just, they're almost like telephone poles so now if you look on the right hand side you'll see how my feet look now and just look at that left foot you can see how I mean you can't see the veins anymore you can't you can't see any definition it's just a big swollen mass and that is to my understanding life-threatening but Minnesota New Jersey Human Resources they couldn't care less about that they're the ones who put me in this situation willingly I also need to do a quick clarification a couple videos back I had pointed out the way that my shoulder has this it's totally off and I'd mentioned uh, at the time that I pointed that out I'd mentioned how I'd fallen on the ice at work so remember at work at this big office building if the crews were not going to be in in time to shovel the snow and get rid of the ice or if they forgot to turn on the heater there's actually a heater on the the walkway and they would just forget to turn it on save 12 cents or whatever so the whole thing would be ice this car has been I don't know if that's the car there's a little blue car that has been coming up next to me they just took off when I grabbed the camera which is what keeps happening there's, there's a little blue car I have some films of it it keeps coming up like right behind my car I'll be out in the middle of a parking lot it'll come up right behind my car like four feet behind it and just sit there and as soon as I look or start looking like I'm pulling a camera up they take off it looks just like that car I've had a lot of stalking behavior lately and I've got some good film of it you're gonna see later Anyway, I had mentioned how when I was walking those 13 months, I fell on the ice. And there's two times in particular I know I fell. One of them, I fell straight down. I mean, I fell where my face literally hit the ice. Or, it was more of a slushy uh, snow, but it, it, my face fell right into it. And in fact, I remember just laying there for a few seconds just... Because there's nothing I could do. It was going to take for... I was soaked. I, uh, how was I going to get up? And the other times, and of course I had fallen on the ice outside of work as well, many times while doing this walk through the Minnesota winter. But at the office, I fell twice that I remember that really, really hurt me, that damaged me. What happened was, it didn't cause this. This was caused, back when my neighbors were making all that noise, they prevented me from being able to use my living room as a fitness room, which is what I'd used it for. So I was built like an Olympian when I moved to Minnesota in 2007 for about four years. I got to use that total gym and keep that up so I was still built like an Olympian then when all the noise started and everything I couldn't even use my home anymore so I couldn't use this total gym even with the headphones on it was just the building shaking and boom so I went about three years without exercising and that's where I lost all the tone and definition of my body so I was probably about 40 41 years old at the time and it's all because of the neighbors because of the loud Minnesota neighbors it's all about them not other people it's all about them so about a year or less than a year before that guy came into this medical company and fired everybody we had our uh, we had a picnic which I don't think we usually had but this year we had a picnic I think it was a spring picnic and we went out there and we were playing frisbee and I just die for the frisbee and I mean I know how to jump I know how to fall I know how to roll 
I know how to do this kind of stuntman sort of thing and from martial arts back when I was younger it's never been a problem for me and it wouldn't have been a problem for me if I had had those three years to keep myself up but I didn't because of those neighbors and I had no idea how much it had hurt my body so even though I fell correctly and even though I rolled correctly it ripped the tendon out of my leg so that I could barely even walk for many weeks I mean I could just barely walk and it hurt so bad I couldn't even drive the car I had to drive my my um, my stick shift essentially with one foot it was horrible but also that's what caused this it snapped this out completely and it's never healed properly what I meant when I pointed to this was that when I fell on the ice it exacerbated this it made this snap out again and it made my whole arm numb I've lost the use of this thumb for what it's worth you know unlike this one where I can do everything I can barely move this one it's only really strong enough to hold I mean I can hold things like this and this is fairly heavy I mean it's like a pound or two but if I have a big bucket of water or something like that it doesn't have the strength to hold it up until the time that this happened with the shoulder I could still do pull-ups I could still do push-ups I could do push-ups and claps I could do um, you know I I take care of my body by using my body and which is something I could do before I moved to Minnesota and when you get those neighbors who screwed up everything because it's all about them other people don't matter I want to bang and stomp around at 2 in the morning I'm gonna bang and stomp around at 2 in the morning other people don't exist so anyway just to clarify I'm not saying that falling on the ice at work is what caused this to pop out it did cause it to kind of sort of pop out a little bit again but it, that's not what caused this it made my whole arm numb though and when I was at the hotel I actually spent a lot of money on a really good sling really comfortable sling and almost all the time that I was in the hotel I mean at the hotel I was wearing this sling even when I was at my keyboard typing um, doing everything I could to try to make sure this didn't heal wrong and it took pretty much almost a year of that 13 months I was there to get the feeling back in my arm fully so now it's almost back to where it was before where I just don't because I used to be able to I used to be a fantastic finger drummer so if you put me on like on a you know 4 by 4 grid an MPC or something I can tap out the beats of my fingers but now I don't have access to this thumb anymore for that so that was taken away from me as well so basically I mean I haven't been sick in 30 years since I stopped going to the doctors I mean again pattern recognition of a scientist I was I was young I was like 20 and I, I just kept saying you know what every time I go to the doctor I get sick maybe I should stop going to the doctor so I stopped going to the doctor and I never got sick again and even more important like like at the hotel you'd have the whole desk staff gets the flu I'm right there with them and everything but I'm not getting the flu and eventually it occurred to me it's like well maybe I should stop going to these doctors because it seems like every time I go to the doctor I get sick so I stopped going to the doctor and I never got sick again so for 30 years I haven't been sick I didn't get COVID didn't but none of that matters when it comes to like a broken bone or something like that I mean it's not a miracle <coughs> it's just not falling for the tricks of the you know medical industry the health fascism which was another one of my existential threats to the United States um, I've got a really weird issue very uncomfortable for me um, at these gas stations you know when I was working for the company I was going to holiday just because of the location they were located near my work and out here as well since I've been stuck in the car I've um, gone to essays more Super Americas and you know when I was a young kid they had uh, stop and go and 7-eleven were the two big convenience store chains um, they had, others were gas stations you know BP and things like this but the big ga the big convenience stores were stop and go and 7-eleven I think stop and go is long gone 7-eleven they buy and sell these and Circle K was just starting out I think at the time although not really in my area I think that was more to the south 
and um, you know, strange things are afoot at the Circle K. Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. And over the years, they bought and sold, bought and sold, and now it's kind of gone round robin. It looks like 7-Eleven's on top because they just bought Super America. So they have their speedy rewards. So every time I would go in there, they would say, "Do you have your speedy rewards card?" And I'd say, "No, I don't. I don't play that game." And then they would start going on some spiel. Well, you really should. He has all these benefits. And I was just like, okay, okay. I, d I just came in to get gas. I just get a hot dog. I'm, I'm not... I don't want to play this game. I went to graduate school for computer science. And one reason I left computer science is because they were trying to get me to program what they do with your information on that card. Okay, I know more about you than... I know more about this than you do. You're a minimum wage gas station worker. Stop telling me to get this card. I know what they do with that information. And I would, even if I tried to tell them that, they would say, because they get something from their bosses. Oh no, we have a privacy policy and we're owned by a subsidiary of a company in Japan and in Japan it's against the law to do all this. And I'm just like, how stupid are these people? It's like, I'm not, I wasn't put on this earth to explain how the world actually works to you. If you want to go on believing that using that card doesn't put your information in systems all over the country, you go ahead and believe it. I could care less. But I was one of the originators to my shame, and I got out of it when I realized what they were doing, which I'm proud of. But that's what they were doing way back in the early 90s, that kind of thing, trying to analyze your phone calls way before terrorism was even a buzzword. That was your government at work back in the early 90s, and I wanted nothing to do with it. I was sickened by graduate school because of that. So this is all the stuff that's going through my mind while these kids are just saying, well, why don't you get a speedy rewards card? And they won't listen when I say, no, I don't want this. Like, like this backstabber at work. All they ever had to say was, no, I don't want this gift. That's all they ever had to say. If they'd said it, I would have stopped, and I would have went on to something productive for somebody who appreciates what I do for them. But they didn't do that, apparently because they didn't want to. Apparently because they wanted to escalate it to the point where they ended up ending my life, which is why I want that person punished. All they ever had to say all that time is no. But I was saying no to these gas station people and they're not listening. No means no, right? That's why if someone says no to me, I stop. If I say no to them, they should stop, but they don't. So eventually, finally, I said, okay, I've had it with this crap. So I, I got the card. I took the card, but I didn't register it. So now I have the stupid card for them to scan. Okay, so that shut them up as far as getting the card. So I, I'm going to do nothing with it, but I keep scanning the card and going through the motions. It's now filled with grime and crud. You know, that thing's been for years. But now I've got the problem since I've been going back to SA. When I scan the card, whenever the the gas station attendant looks at that, they go like, holy moly, you got like half a million points. You got to register this thing. And now they won't shut up about me registering it. And it's like, will you, will you leave me alone? I don't want to register your stupid card. Yeah, but you can get a $50 gift certificate. People just don't know how this world works. They are so ignorant and oblivious. So I can't shut these people up. They, they just, they, they won't stop. When I say no, I don't want to register it, they don't stop there. They just keep going on and on and on with their spiels. But another thing is this. What am I supposed to say to them? Well, you know what? I would register it and get the $50 thing, but I live in my car. I don't have a home. I don't have an address. I'm completely disenfranchised from American society, so I'm not even eligible for this stupid card of yours because I'm disenfranchised, and that's what that means. It means I don't get to do what every other citizen gets to do. But I don't want to say that to them either. So I wish these people would just shut up and stop telling me to register their dang card. It's a scam to begin with. I, I don't need a gas station knowing what size underwear I wear. And I don't know why anybody out there wants that to save five cents off a gallon of gas. I, I, oh, people. All right, another correction uh, on the 
the video I did for the lift garage I talked about my history of cars and I screwed up the beginning and you know even as I was saying it, I thought something's not right here but I, I, I had to think it through and I still can't remember the exact thing but I said I got that Datsun 200 SX that my dad got through the leasing company um, when I was 17 or right when I was going to college that is not right at all <laughs> when I went to college I moved about 80 miles to a huge university big mistake we'll talk about some other time um, but I rode the bus I didn't have a car I didn't need a car I walked across campus whatever um, the school blew it was horrifying so I left after a year and I came back and I lived at home and I started going to a school that was about 30 miles away and I would drive one of my parents cars to and from work 30 miles about 25 30 miles one way it was about two years after that is when my dad got me this car so it was actually quite a while it was about three years after high school when I got this car my first real car mine and then it was about three months later when this coked out freak rammed it and destroyed it and took me out of school for two years um, so the timing was a bit off on there but otherwise everything was accurate um, I think the reason I associated it with high school was because you know my dad did take me to the high school you know I'd been out of high school for three years but he did take me to the high school parking lot to teach me how to drive the five-speed um, the next thing it's not gonna start for a couple more hours here but these kids with these loud cars that sound like NASCARs they are driving me insane I mean they drive for they go to I guess they go to school I would think they'd be smarter if they went to school but they're apparently their parents buy them a car that cost as much as my entire salary from last year and the kids don't actually have to go to work for it because when I'm sitting there staring all day long I see these same cars just circle around town for seven or eight hours straight so beginning at 3 or 3 30 these cars come out there's about a dozen of them and they are so incredibly loud and violent sounding just <laughs> and they backfire <laughs> they are so violent sounding they just they just make my it's like being in a war zone that's one of the things that with noise and health when you're in a war zone if you run out of ammunition you create a bunch of noise because it creates the same physiological effects in people as artillery landing near you so all day every day because these kids don't seem to have a job they get out of school and then they spend the next seven eight hours driving around in circles with these cars racing them running red lights I don't know why nobody stops them they've been doing it for three years out here and uh, then they do the same thing on Saturday and Sunday all day long I don't see where these kids ever work for a living because I'm sitting there all day and I see them the entire day Saturday Sunday the entire afternoon and evening and night during the week so when are they working to pay for these cars but they are so violently loud they're they're horrific and they're 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 starting to drive me over the edge because it is just when this starts up in a couple hours it is a nightmare there's nowhere I can go to get away from it you can hear them literally a mile away they literally sound like NASCARs it's like being parked next to a NASCAR track Um, I've mentioned this kind of thing before, so there's not much point to go into big detail, but with all this junk in the car, if I grab something, and let's say it's on the bottom, right now I have a blanket with my drumsticks on it, the headphones, this keyboard, and some cookies, but let's say I have to find my portable recorder because I want to record one of these farting cars. Well, if I don't know where it is, I have to dig around for it. And if it's dark, that means I have to do it blind. Well, as I'm doing that, guess what? All this stuff falls off it falls that way it falls this way it falls toward the door and if I'm lucky enough to find my recorder then I don't know what I've done with all this stuff because I've knocked something off onto the floor then I spill the coffee and the next thing I know is whatever fell on the floor that I didn't even know fell there got soaked with coffee and when it falls between the door I have to do it right then and there because I can't allow myself to forget so wherever I am I stop I grab a flashlight I walk outside I slowly open the door something will probably fall out onto the ground 
and I have to try to make sure I shove everything back in and the reason is so that I don't forget and one day open that door at night when I can't see and have something like a hard drive fall out and I don't even know it's falling out because it had fallen between the door. This is not something you have to deal with when you're, when you're in your home. If you want your keyboard, you just go over to your desk where your keyboard has been sitting where it should be. You don't have to dig around in a car like this and find it buried underneath a bunch of dirty shoes. The meth pipe and that video where I showed my walk from the hotel to work, which that walk was on a day when there was no traffic, that's why I filmed it, and it was summertime or fall or whatever. So it was only about 20, 22 minutes, something like that. In the winter, that walk took more like 35 minutes because it was thick snow and ice all over the place. And you've got all that traffic. So when you get to that area where you have to cross the roads, I can't just walk across the road. I have to wait two, three, four minutes for each of those stoplights. So that walk actually took a lot longer than 20 minutes. I, I filmed it on the day when, I, when it was most convenient to film it. No traffic, no bad weather. So it, it made it look a lot faster than it was. And I don't think they even had the locust swarms on that day. That whole last leg had locust swarms. I'm just, just getting pelted by these grasshoppers the whole time. Anyway, at the end of that, I pointed out where that meth pipe had been outside our big office building. So it was right there. Anyone walking in from the parking lot who drove to work would see that meth pipe sitting there. And I can't find the video. I, I, I documented it somehow. I can't remember, though. I either videotaped it or I photographed it. I might have had my good digital SLR camera with me at the time. That would make more sense that I'd take it that way. I can't find the chip for that. I just can't find anything. So I've been trying to find that image of the meth pipe or video or whatever I took, but I can't find it. It's there somewhere in all this, all these chips and jump drives and, uh, but you know, I mean, they, they give such obscure names on these file names, you know, MV2904412. They're not date stamped and everything. So I just can't find it. Anyway, so just for the record, here's what the meth pipe looked like. This is just a stock photo. It wasn't quite as dirty at the end, but it was a bit dirty. But it looked like, I mean, used, in other words. It looked like this. This is what was laying right outside our professional office building for at least two... There's one of those cars right there. Um, how great is it that way? So this meth pipe sitting outside this professional office building, I would say for maybe three or four weeks. It was at least two weeks. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to imply here either that the backstabber dropped that meth pipe. There, that's total speculation. There would be absolutely no way to know something like that. Um, although, at least, if you recall, I witnessed an act by one of their group, which, as I said before, if it wasn't the ingestion of drugs, I can't imagine what they were doing. And that would have involved something like a pipe. But... I have no evidence that they dropped that pipe, and I'm not implying that they did drop that pipe. It could have been dropped by someone in one of the other businesses. My point is that it is so naive for people to say, Oh, we're a bunch of professionals. There's no drug use here. You've got a meth pipe sitting outside your door for weeks. No, there's a lot of drug use by people inside that building. A lot of it. And this group, this clique, that the backstabber was part of showed the most signs, the most well-known signs of this kind of thing. Whether they dropped the meth pipe or not, I haven't the foggiest idea. And I'm never going to claim that I know they did. The last thing I would mention is I still have this box with the food. This is food that I bought right before I got fired because they don't give me any warning at all. They don't tell you what's going on. So I go out and I spend 25 bucks on food. It's all these kinds of noodles and everything. And I had all the sausages and meats that I would mix in with them. So I put them in my cubicle for the week's meal. And I only got one of them because the next day all of a sudden I'm locked out of the building. So I've been stuck with all this food that I paid for that I can't cook. I mean, I made like two of them when I was in the hotel, but I was so sick to my stomach from what was going on at the hotel, I couldn't even eat, I couldn't sleep. It was not a fun time at the hotel. 
So I've been trying to find a home for this stuff, and I can't. So I drove all the way to Apple Valley, and then I went to Grace Church, which has a social service called Link. And I couldn't quite remember what they do, but I thought they gave out food. So I went in and I said, you know, I've got a bunch of food. It's not a huge amount, but I don't want to just throw it away. I'd like to give it to somebody. And they said, well, we don't take that kind of food. And I was like, all right, great. You know, and they were very nice. Grace, Grace Church is a nice group of people, good people. And, um, but they did what everyone does in a situation like that. They went straight to the pamphlets and said, well, have you tried, have you tried? It's like after nine years, I had tried all of them the first year. That's what wasted all my time, waiting for all these social services to say, no, we can't help you. That's the period when I sold off everything I had worked for those eight years prior in Minnesota since I moved to Minnesota. Everything of value I had gotten, I had to sell off. Just like right now, New Jersey Human Resources expects me to just sell off everything that I worked to earn honestly over the last eight years. Again! So that at the end of that, I will be back to exactly what I had 16 years earlier. I'm sorry, 18 years earlier, which was nothing but an empty van. These six psychopaths. These monsters. My God, these people need to be held accountable. I pray that the Justice Department will do the right thing when I'm gone. I pray that they will do the right thing when I'm gone. If they let these people get away with this, God's going to have to create a, a hotter section of hell for them to make up for it. So while I was at Grace Church, they had mentioned Link. They said, well, maybe Link will take it. And I'd mentioned that I'd, I'm trying to keep my distance from them. You know, pe people's normal inclination is to kind of walk around the room, and sometimes they get close to you, sometimes they're further, but they're not thinking in terms of, I need to keep my distance from this person, although they did with COVID and all that, but nowadays they're not thinking those terms. But once they get the smell, it's a whole other story. So as a courtesy, I'm trying to stay away from these people without looking like I'm disrespecting them by staying away from them. It's a stupid balancing act I have to do just because I smell. And, um, and I'd mentioned, you know, well, I don't have a shower. And they said, well, why don't you go to Prince of Peace? And I'm just like, Ugh. you know, bless their hearts. They don't, they're, they're trying to help. But again, I know all the places to go. I wasted all these years with these social services that have done zip for me. Last time I went to Prince of Peace was over the Christmas holiday. It was one of the places I had tried throughout the entire Christmas, New Year's holiday to try to get a shower. I told them I would love to keep my job. I've been there almost eight years. I'd love to keep my job, but I can't shower. They're renovating the showers at my workplace, and I can't get a shower. And they said, oh, there's nothing we can do for you. The problem was I had taken a shower at that church, Prince of Peace, because they have showers in their basement. I'd taken it about four years ago, so the church lied to me so I'm trying to find a way without just wanting to explode to tell these really nice people who are trying to help me no I don't Prince of Peace is of no help and I'm trying to find a way to say that without saying Prince of Peace as a church lied to me and yet they still get 501c3 tax exempt status as a church that follows the Bible one of which the Ten Commandments in that Bible says well, it says, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. So I guess they are allowed to lie. Okay. I guess Prince of Peace is off the hook. They're allowed to lie. I still think it's wrong for them to lie, though. Anyway, so they said, for a moment there, the woman I was speaking with said, well, why don't you try Link over there? And then she caught herself, and she said, oh, wait, you're older than 22, aren't you? I was like, yeah, a little bit. Because Link only serves people who are 22 years and younger. And this is the problem. It's one of the big problems we have with social services. That's why social services is a fraud. And it needs to be burned to the ground and completely rebuilt. Because each of these social services, the way that they have to get funding from government and private entities, they have to tackle a specific issue. So we're here to help black veterans. So I walk in the door and they immediately tell me, uh, you're not black, we can't help you. Okay, so I go to the next one over there and I walk in and it's like, oh, we only help women with children. So you have to be a woman, but you also have to have 
children and your children have to be below a certain age like 12 years and eight months and seven days just all these stupid criteria and it's like well I'm not a woman so you can't help me so I go to the next one and they say well we only help women with children and I was like well it's so did the last place I went to and it's like oh yeah but we only help Hispanic women with children if you're black woman with a child we can't help you you have to go to the other one and I'm like okay So every one of these is focused on helping some specific person. The only people who seem to actually get help are battered women and drug addicts, which is something I don't understand because if you're dumb enough to go up there and pour some white powder up and snort it up your nose or to stick a needle in your arm with some hair, if you're dumb enough to do something like that, why are taxpayers paying to help you get off those drugs? It seems like you knew exactly what you were doing when you made the conscious decision to take like that meth pipe and put a bunch of household chemicals into that pipe and light it on fire and inhale that. Everybody's got a problem with cigarettes which really I don't even want to get into the cigarette thing but that doesn't cause anywhere near this kind of damage. It certainly doesn't put people into a body bag as they're smoking a cigarette like these drugs do. They're killing people left and right, right on the spot, young people. But those are the people who get help. So even though you made a conscious decision to do something that is so monumentally stupid as to take a drug, a mind-altering drug, we all have to pay for it, including me, the homeless guy who has his taxes taken out from his paychecks. I have to pay for you to get off your drugs. And when it comes to battered women, of course I want battered women to get help. But the problem is when they set up these systems so that all these resources are funneled for a specific purpose like battered women, what if the battered woman also needs help with something else? Well, the battered women's shelter isn't there for that purpose. It's only there to help protect her from her abuser. And of course, they're making assumptions that this abuser is abusive in the first place because it is possible for a woman to game that system to play that game to get back at their boyfriend or whatever there's all it's very very complicated but to be fair there are a lot of women and the fact is there's a lot of men who are battered as well emotionally and physically by their girlfriends and their wives and these men get no help at all none whatsoever just <clears throat> nothing but if you're a battered woman you get all this help my point being that they need to burn social services to the ground. They need to just end every single one of them and start all over. And instead of having a qualification, your qualification should be this. Are you a human being? Yes. Are you alive? Yes. Come on in. We'll help you. What do you need? That should be what social services does. Because you know what? In a situation like that, not only does the battered woman go in there and get everything she needs, not just what the battered woman's shelter is going to give her, but the food shelf or whatever else she needs, she's going to get it all. Because they're just there to help people who need help. But also, I would be able to walk into a place like that, and guess what? I meet that criteria. They would have helped me. Instead of saying, you're too old, you're too young, you're too white, you're too male. You don't have one sixteenth Native American blood in you. You're not a veteran. You're not this. You're not that. You're not the other thing. You're too healthy. Social services should be burned to the ground and started over and there should just be one social service that helps human beings with what they need. This compartmentalization of social services to address these specific issues. And it all goes back to the way that funding happens. It's all political. And it's because these politicians, in the end, don't care one whit whether any of these people gets the help they need. Which is why they allow 4 million homeless people to rot and die off camera. As I would be right this instant if I did not know how to use this camera. No one in the world would even know the kind of misery and suffering and torment I'm going through in this car for the last month if I did not know how to use this camera. But what about the other four million homeless people who don't have access to a camera or they don't know how to use it or they don't know how to use YouTube? If they would revamp social services from the ground up, they might be able to help a whole lot more people and do it more efficiently 
saving money. I mean, that remember I was when I was in revenue management and everything. I mean, it, this is just business. The problem is that nobody cares in the first place. There's always an ulterior motive for creating this new social service. Always an ulterior motive. And especially, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be political, but the simple fact is, Democrats run, they game that system. Just like they, the way that they manipulate which homeless people get to vote to make sure that the odds are only the ones who are gonna vote Democrat jump through these ridiculous social service hoops to have the right to vote. And the Democrat and the Republicans do it too, but the Democrats are definitely the ones who do it the most. They set up these social services for their own benefit. And in the end, they could care less whether one person or zero or everyone who walks in the door gets assistance. Because they just don't care if those people live or die. They don't even think about them. They only think about the institution that they help set up or help get funded because somehow, some way, it's going to help them get reelected. So that's what I have on my catch-up here diary. Um, I got plenty of other things, but I just wanted to get these some of these things out of the way. It is now getting really hot. Um, yeah, I'm getting the sweat in my hernia. So I gotta get these windows open and try to cool off. Um, I'll be back with the next entry when I'm back with the next entry.